Hello and welcome to uh, the, the second day, day two of our workshop on endemic COVID-19. And um, this is a program for mathematics for public health. I'm now going to hand you over to uh, one of the workshop organizers, uh, Professor Jacques Belair, who will introduce this session. So thank you um, <clears throat> for your presence here. And uh, what I will first do is make a slight uh, presentation on going over the main points of the presentations of, of yesterday. So uh, one thing that came out from the discussions over the two se uh, teams sessions was that uh, mathematics was um, permeating the general public. And uh, as was mentioned, the exponential has now become a common word. And so people looking at exponential curves is going exponentially. And in fact, as was alluded by uh, Nick Agden, the uh, uh, spring of 2020 was a golden age of modeling where mathematicians were all over the media. And so the object of this workshop, the two days is really fundamentally to, uh, in the words of Gauguin, this um, assess uh, where we're coming from, where we are and where we're going. And it came out quite um, significantly that the question of, are we ready for the next pandemics has to be asked uh, both in terms of the next occurrence and also the transition from pandemic to epidemics. And the conclusion of the first session was, if you want to prepare peace, you must, if you want peace, you must prepare for war. And so the challenges that came out uh, going forward as uh, lessons learned from the last almost two years is that communication between modelers and decision makers is crucial to um, the usefulness and the consequence of mathematical modeling and uh, helping handle the pandemics. And that there are four T's of importance in this context, trust between uh, people at the table, transparency, exchange of um, concerns and knowledge, time, um, because uh, level, of level of evidence that's uh, traditionally used for data gathering and data informed decision making is ill suited for an emergency. Um, truth, bad news is bad news, and it's also con um, related to transparency. Uh, there's worth in consensus, confronting different models and methodologies. So having uh, ideas even within modelers and scenario explorations are crucial for the bottom line. Uh, have uh, five year old questions of the type, what if? And data, data is uh, the weakest link, in, uh, weakest link in many endeavors having detailed population level data, heterogeneity within subgroups, and even data on basic science like virology. And one uh, speaker yesterday, <clears throat> one speaker mentioned that more and more in some context, so you never have too much data. So without further ado, I will now uh, pass the baton to Sarah, who will uh, chair the next uh, session. Okay, thank you very much, Jack. That was great and a really good summary of, uh, of where we are at the moment. So um, this theme, just as a reminder, is incorporating human behavior in epidemic modeling. Um, I'd like to welcome our speakers and panels. Our, we've got a Ro Roxanne de la Salle-Bonnière, I should have checked before we started, uh, and she will be presenting with her PhD student, Clementine Cordy. Um, we have uh, Shana Rosenbaum, uh, Rebecca Tyson and then uh, at the end we'll have a panel session with Joshua Epstein and Michael Lee uh, and all of the group will be presenting in that uh, panel. Um, so just to introduce uh, Roxana and uh, Clementine, um, their title is Incorporating Human Behaviours and Perceptions in Epidemic Modelling, the Evolution of Adherence to Sanitary Measures by Canadians with COVID-19. Uh, Roxana is a full professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Montréal 
And uh, she has, uh, her research focuses on the challenges people face when they're exposed to profound social change, such as the colonization that affected Canada's original uh, Aboriginal people uh, or immigration. She also works with other groups undergoing profound social change, notably in Mongolia, Russia, uh, Kyrgyzstan and South Africa. The COVID-19 project is part of her quest to understand social change and identify the interventions that are most beneficial to the collective well-being. Uh, Clementine Cordy is coordinator and research and teaching assistant uh, with Professor Eric Lacourse. She is a member of the Social Change and Identity Laboratory as a doctoral student and statistical ana analyst. She's currently pursuing a PhD in sociology focusing on access to mental uh, health care among young Quebecers. So this fits very nicely in the public health uh, lens of health equity, which is really one of the core pillars of, of public health. So uh, thank you both and we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, I will share my screen. Um, is that good now? It so, looks good. So you see the screen. So hi everyone, uh, it's a real pleasure to be here today. I hope you will understand me, me well in spite of my French accent. Um, and I want to begin with uh, thanking Clémentine for being here today with me. Uh, and also uh, Jean-Marc Lina, who has prepared this uh, presentation, and I know he's in the audience too, as well as uh, some of our students, Sarah, Sheila, and Ivana, who has helped to prepare. Uh, before I go on, maybe Clémentine, you can say a few words to present yourself, and then I will go, and she will uh, present the most uh, difficult part of this presentation, which is all the, the mathematics and the statistics. So I leave that part to her. So Clémentine. Um, yeah, so hi, as Sarah just said, I'm a PhD student in sociology. Um, I work with Laksan and Eric Lacos in the laboratory. And in the last few months, I've been working on analysis for trajectories of adherence to sanitary measures. So this is what I will be presenting today. Thank you, Klimatsin. Um, so I want to start with speaking of why I'm in, I am here today. Uh, since 1997, I've been really fascinated and especially motivated to work with human beings that have been transformed with context in context of dramatic social change. So I've been living with uh, people, including that babushka, her name was Zoya, and living with them. And I have learned that with all those months, I've li lived closely with her and others, that social change can have really hard re repercussions on people's life. Uh, when she was 20 years old, she was deported uh, from the Soviet Union to go to Central Asia in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan, where she started to work as a chief engineer of the, the main city, Bishkek, the capital. And when the fall of the Soviet Union came, so she had a really, really high position in life. And when the fall of the Soviet Union happened, she has no money anymore to buy food, even including some fruits like bananas. And she had to sell the newspaper of the local newspaper at the corner of her street at the end of her full day of work. And it was just fascinating to me that her story was just one of a million. And I was really, really shocked and frustrated many years <laughs> that no one or very little people, scientists in my field, social psychology, would take um, attention to this very important topic, which is about dramatic social change. Uh, so today, this is why I, what I wrote, we are all babushkas in a way, because we go through this COVID-19 crisis, which has repercussions in all our lives. In my research, I did a lot of work since 97 on trying to understand what is dramatic social change. And I want to go over this very quickly. First, it comes from uh, more than 5,000 articles I've read in sociology and psychology to get to that theory. And what I did is I, I examined a lot of abstracts and then read in deeply some articles, more than 300, to, um, to find that 
dramatic social change was four main characteristics. So first, it's something that occurs very occurs very fast from one day to the other, like the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, there's ruptures in our institution, government, the schools are closing, the hospitals are, are in rupture, so I don't need to explain further. And change in behaviors, like for this crisis we have today, we wear masks, we do meetings like today on Zoom, and, and so on. We need to work with our children running around us. And they might occur in this conference because today is a pedagogical day, so who knows. And then it brings a threat to ourselves. We question ourselves and what does it mean, for instance, to be Canadians in these times of uncertainties. And so our project mainly is titled COVID-19 Canada, the end of the world as we know it. We have many partners and many uh, researchers and students working with us. Uh, our activities, we divided in three main things because we never want to forget the human behind the numbers we analyze. Uh, first, we wanted to understand, describe uh, and inform public and policies with our data. Uh, then we are moving through that phase and, and maybe we can discuss that further to get more into the deepness and the complexity of understanding the dynamics of change and especially how people um, cope with dramatic social change in real time. And we also have a, um, a focus on community interventions because we believe that when everyone is affected, we need to start to think differently and think collectively and think about collective solutions. But we won't speak of this today. More specifically with the research we are presenting today, uh, our general questions is, is to understand the dynamic related to stability and change with the COVID-19 crisis. We had three major teams in our questionnaires and surveys. One is adherence to measure of health measure. This is what we will speak today. We had a lot of measures too on social cohesions, um, why people reject others or not, things like that. So if ever someone is interested in these issues, you can let us know. And of course, all that matters with well-being and resilience processes where like we want to understand why and when and what makes it that people can um, rebound like bounce up I don't know in face of adversity when adversity occurs so for today we had two main research questions we had what influence adherence to sanitary measures considering this human factor and then how did sanitary measures evolved in times for Canadians uh, since the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis. What we did with uh, our students, we did a, a review of the literature and we gather all the possible factors that can be influencing uh, additions to sanitary measures. So we have identified a few and so such as of course, sociodemographic factors. We hear more about those currently, like gender, um, age, individual and personal factors, social factors, factors related to sanitary measures themselves, factors related to COVID-19, government-related factors, and formation-related factors, which is the, the team of preference of Klimatien, and she can tell you a little bit more later after. And we have classified, so the mise en forme went out here, but we have classified our all the questions and sort of topics we have in our survey in terms of these eight factors, uh, such as demographic factors. In red, it concerns mostly some, um, uh, some motivational factor. In green here, social norm, clarity of sanitary measure perceived is more about perceptions. And the one you have in bold are the one we will speak today. So more concretely, what we did is we had the opportunity to conduct research that was funded by the um, 
uh, RSC, the CIHR, sorry, I'm used to speak in French. So, and we had 3,600 and a little more Canadians fill up a survey periodically at many times, uh, many, many times. And it was a representative survey in terms of age, gender, and province of residence. Uh, we had a high uh, response rate for, for, for a web panel. Um, one thing to consider with our data, it's multi-waves, so 11 waves so far. We will conduct the next wave in a few weeks, maybe in two, three weeks, maybe four. We had a plan missingness, uh, so we did put some missing values and we have some techniques to replace those missing values to shorten the survey so people are not too fatigued and that allowed us to ask more questions also. Uh, they were recruited with a web panel so we have the advantages and the disadvantages of, of that. Uh, participants were allowed to respond to to subsequent, so if they didn't answer once, they could yet answer the other one, the, the other survey. In the beginning, our survey was designed to be for five months, but then as many Canadians, uh, we didn't expect to go so long this crisis. So we started to extend and extend our measurement points. So it's unequal periods between survey times. Uh, it's representative for most demographic variable. We have tested a lot of them, except for level of education, a bit higher educated, which is the same in much panels. Um, we have a, a little bit less French speakers and a little bit less indigenous people than Statistic Canada's um, uh, comparison point in 2016. And over time, attrition also is higher for the youth, which is also normal with web panel. Uh, it's really hard to recruit the youth. So uh, those are just our measurement time that you can uh, have access after uh, if you wish. Uh, in terms of, uh, I'm trying to, to look at the time, make sure I leave space for what's the most interesting. Um, so our behaviors related to sanitary measures. So we have about 10, but for today, we only present four. Uh, and they are the one that Clementine found after doing a review of the literature that were most pertinent today. But uh, of course, we have done some for the other behaviors and we can do more for the for some others as well. So maintain a distance of at least two meters, wear a mask, stay at home as much as you can, and wash your hands for 20 seconds when you're at home. How often do you do that? And we have also with the human factors, perceptions, motivations. So we have a lot of variables with this. And what we did for today, and also when we began to do our research, was selecting the one that were often talked about in the literature, in the scientific literature. And so we went with this. However, there's certainly an opportunity for data mining or, you know, with some advanced methods statistical or mathematical analysis to find ways to pull out all those uh, variables and see is there some that are more pertinent at one point or the other in time but that's to be discussed however for now we have those questions we looked at perception of clarity and perception of coherence of the policies by our governments so do people think it's clear it means that do they think it's well defined? Do they know what to do, when to do it? Uh, coherence is, is it coherent between each other, the measures or between level of government, Canada, Quebec? You know, so, so we play with those terms. We include also social norms because social norms is a very important perception that if you think that most Canadians wear masks in public or they, they, they adhere to a norm, to a rule, well, then you, you will be influenced by that thought. So that perception is very important as well. And Clementine was very interested because there was a, a lot of things in the literature about this, about um, information 
and the source of information also. So it's all related to misinformation and she can tell you more about it and I will let her speak and then I will conclude at the end. Clementine? Yes, um, so uh, just before I start with the various factors, uh, the results I'm gonna present are results of latent trajectory analysis. So uh, basically what we did is, as Roxanne just said, we identified four key sanitary measures, which were um, uh, washing hands, uh, wearing the mask, social distancing and staying home or avoiding gatherings, it's like pretty much the same thing. Um, and we model latent trajectories of adherence using the proctage, um package in SAS. So uh, this is quite a unique uh, technique that is only uh, usable in, in SAS. And basically it allows us to find what model of latent trajectories fits best with our data in a very inductive way. So you don't have a lot of like pre-assumptions and you can test different numbers of trajectories and the order of each trajectory to find the one that fits really best with the data mathematically using things like the Bayesian information criterion to decide which is the best model and with theoretical reasoning also, like just what trajectories make sense. So this is what I'm gonna be presenting. Um, so the first, uh, uh, the first measure we checked was maintaining social distancing. So what you can see here is the average trajectory for the whole sample. So obviously this is more of an indication because this method is not made to do only one trajectories, it's more for multiple trajectories. But what we can see is that in average, people started out with a very high adherence level, so a nine out of 10. And here all throughout, like at the time, we can see that people have just a very high adherence because it's varying between like eight out of 10 and nine out of 10. So it's a very good level of adherence to this measure. But what the like this shape is indicating is that basically adherence followed the waves and the restrictions that were put in place. So it started out very high because we were all confined. And then in the summer, the restrictions were loosened a little bit. So adherence went a little down and then it came back up in the winter when uh, restrictions were put back again. So it really just, um, we don't have the screen anymore. Sorry. <laughs> My PowerPoint crashed, so I'm really right. sorry, um, I, I will guess. reinstall it, but I'm sure you have a home trajectory. The average trajectory is very, very similar to what we just saw. So it's um, almost the same shape. Again, it kind of follows the wave. But what's very interesting is to go and check uh, more the like multi trajectories models. So for um, the first measure, which is uh, keeping social distancing when outside the home, we got a model with four trajectories that we can see right here. So Oof. this is a model that had the best uh, big in this, uh, in index. And um, so we have four trajectories. The first one is uh, the red one high above. And we can see that's people who have a very, very high adherence level. So they say that they always adhere to that measure all throughout the pandemic. So it, it didn't waver, it's all, it also includes people that are maybe more at risk, like older people. So it, it makes sense that they have a higher adherence level. And then we have the second and third trajectory that are basically a reflection of what we just saw as the average trajectory, but with a little bit of different starting points. But it's really following the waves, as I just explained. And then we have the fourth trajectory, which is really the low adherence trajectory that includes about 8% of people. So that's, that's also, um, let's say, encouraging uh, because more than 90% of people have very, very high adherence level and it doesn't really change, which is a good thing for uh, infection or preventing infections. So uh, the fourth trajectory, uh, it started out a lot lower than the other ones and kept going slowly down as the pandemic went through. So that's really um, an expression of uh, pandemic uh, fatigue that we talk about a lot and we hear about a lot recently. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, I was explaining when, when we didn't have the slides, that's the staying home to of average trajectory. And again, it kind of follows the same shape. And if we check the multi-trajectory model for that measure, it also is very, very similar. So staying home and maintaining social distancing are two measures that were uh, um, often presented together by the government and the media. So uh, it feels like people really associated them and have kind of the same um, 
reaction to, to, to it through time. So uh, again, here we have the second, third, and fourth trajectory that all follow this kind of average shape with the fourth trajectory being lower. And also with the interval um, confidence interval being a lot uh, bigger. So it shows that in the lowest adherence, there's more variation. People who don't adhere as well to the measures don't necessarily follow exactly the same trajectories through time. Um, and then the next measure we checked was mask wearing. So this is the average trajectory for mask wearing. As you can see, this doesn't have the same shape as the previous two ones at all. Um, this is because mask wearing wasn't, um, well, it doesn't start at the same time for starters. So we started measuring it at the fifth wave of our survey because it wasn't really talked about in the beginning of the pandemic in Canada. So we started measuring when it became more of a subject and it became mandatory in most provinces, starting with Quebec around the seventh or eighth wave. So we can see that um, adherence really started out not too low at six and really um, went up, increased really, really quickly and got very, very high and stabilized as soon as it became mandatory. So it, there was a very good adherence with that measure. Um, however, the um, <laughs> multi-trajectory models shows a little more, uh, yeah, uh, sorry, yeah, <laughs> um, um, more um, detail and nuance uh, portrait of that. So the first, second and fourth trajectory, so the red, green and uh, black one all follow that kind of shape where it started out low, but it, um, adherence increased really quickly and became kind of just stabilized at a very high level once it was mandatory. But we also have the fifth trajectory um, that's 3% of people. So that's really like the 3% of the population that has the least, um, doesn't really comply with the measures. And this one started out very, very low. And even as it became mandatory and most people started wearing the mask, adherence level didn't really go up more than five or six. So that's really people who were more um, refractory to uh, wearing a mask. And the third trajectory that is kind of stable at around seven, eight, uh, we don't really know what to do with that one. It's maybe people who were already used to wearing the mask or who kind of follow the rules, but don't really care. So it depends. Uh, we, we don't really know. It includes about 10% of people. So that was th that one was a little peculiar. And finally, uh, we checked washing hands because it was one of the measure uh, or hand hygiene as a general concept with um, also like Purell and everything that was a lot used in the literature. But uh, what we saw is that actually it is it had zero effect in our samples. So it felt like people just had their habits. So they they washed their hands a certain number of times a day and that's it. And they didn't change their habits at all with the pandemic. Um, it's also worth to note that um, the government didn't really uh, put a lot of emphasis on this. So it's not one of the measures that was as much explained and like put in front um, with, they talk about it, but more like a side note. So it might explain why people didn't really associate that with a pandemic uh, countermeasure. They just kind of went on uh, with their life. And that's why I don't have also the average trajectory because the average trajectory was just kind of a straight line in the middle with very, very big confidence interval. So it just didn't really say anything. So that's for washing hands. Um, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about risk factors. So risk factors in latent trajectory analysis, basically we take um, uh, different factors or variables at the first time and we check how people's response to, uh, or. Um, their state of being <laughs> at the first time affects the probability of being in each trajectories. Um, so what I'm going to talk about here are more like generalization or summary of what we observed for most of those sanitary measures, because I can go through the specific of each measures. Um, so social distancing, staying home, and mask wearing were affected by all of those factors that I'm going to present, but not hand washing. So everything I'm going to say doesn't apply to hand washing, because as I said, it wasn't really affected by the pandemic. People just kind of went on with their life. <laughs> so uh, first, if we check social demographic factors uh, in um, agreement with many studies that have checked this proportion of men is a little higher in lower trajectories. So the lower the adherence, the more men there is in this trajectory, but it doesn't, it varies between like 40 and 60. So it's not like extremely, but there's a little more men in the lower 
adherence trajectories. Um, similarly, with age, uh, we checked it really uh, with the quantitative variable of age, so not groups. And uh, what we can see is that basically mean age uh, really um, decreases as we lower the adherence trajectory. So the higher adherence trajectory, people who were classified in it had the mean age was higher. And as we go down, the mean age uh, gets lower. So it kind of tells us that um, the younger people follow maybe a little less um, this uh, uh, sorry, adherence uh, to measures. Um, education, I thought it was a very interesting result because it did not have as much as of, an, of an impact as we might have thought. So a lot of people kind of assume that education has a, an impact on adherence because people understand better or stuff like that. But when we check the impact by itself and also mostly when we used all of the social factors that I'm going to talk um, just after in multiple regression, the level of education really did not have a, a big impact. Sometimes a little bit for the lowest trajectories, people were a little less educated, but it was really a small effect. So not as big as we might have thought. Um, no, uh, right now we don't have uh, graphs. We only have, uh, sorry, I'm just responding to the comment. We only have um, like the uh, risk factors because uh, if I have to go through all the graphs, it's gonna be very, very long and we only have half an hour. <laughs> um, so, um, and we also checked immigration status. Uh, basically, it didn't really have an effect, but if it had an effect, usually it was that immigrants uh, were in higher adherence trajectories uh, when they, it had an effect, which sometimes. Um, it, then social factors. So this is what we're most interested in. Um, so we checked for perceived coherence of measures, perceived clarity, understanding information, which was kind of composed from many uh, questions to classify people as understanding a little average and a lot the information regarding COVID. Social norms. So if people felt that other people in their provinces were following the measures, it affects whether or not they follow it. And uh, the reliability of used sources. So um, for perceived coherence, clarity, and understanding, they basically all had the same effect. The more you feel like the measures are coherent, clear, or the more you understand them, the more likely you are to be in the higher uh, adherence trajectory. But mostly it really discriminated against the lowest adherence trajectory. So sometimes between like the three higher ones, it didn't really have an impact. Uh, to answer, oh, there's a lot of questions in the chat. I don't know if I should answer them now or later. Maybe, okay, I'll check them later. But um, yeah, it's self-reported perceptions mostly. So um, mostly, yeah, so people in the lowest trajectory were really people who uh, perceived a lack of coherence, lack of clarity, and they didn't understand well. And uh, same for the social norms. So um, the more people uh, agreed that people in their provinces uh, follow the measures, the more likely they were to have a higher adherence level. And uh, finally, reliability of used sources. So uh, this we coded as using mostly reliable sources or using unreliable sources like uh, social media, your community, stuff like that. And um, people who used unreliable sources were really more likely to be in the lowest adherence trajectory. Again, didn't really discriminate between like the one to three of higher trajectories, but the lowest one was very much affected by that factor. So uh, all of this kind of tells us that for people to follow <laughs> the measures, they have to feel like they're coherent, they're clear, they have to understand them. And uh, obviously a little bit to use good sources that talk about the measures in a reliable way. But um, when we took all of those factors together, understanding coherence and clarity did have more of an impact than reliability of used sources. So I can I just uh, jump in there and just check, are yeah. you meaning to progress your slides or is it because we're still on the same? Yeah, no, uh, the, since this was supposed to be kind of a summary, it's what it was one the only okay. one slide. Just and um, <laughs> uh, actually, I'm done. So we can jump back to it. <laughs> You guys wanted some mathematics here, right? Eh? Is that the idea? But uh, we, we thought we'd discuss those ideas with you. And then if you are interested in more of the details, we can always share them with you. So to conclude, uh, there's many variables that are very important uh, to understand adherence. Um, 
whether it be perception, emotion. So more work needs to be done to really understand the power of each of one, but maybe in relation with the other ones too. And also to understand their dynamics in time. So maybe those perceptions, variables, or self-reported variables would play a role at one point in time, but not in another point in time, because the crisis is evolving through times. Um, so to finish, uh, we would be very happy to answer your questions, uh, I guess, at the end of the conference. And thanks for inviting us. And um, that's it, I will unshare. Thank you.